be very honest with you, to be invited up here. Um, Boston is a favorite city of mine. Used to come up here quite often when I was a student at the Naval War College and then later when I was a professor there because you have good theater and good food. <laughs> Gaza and Ukraine are stealing, eating up, evaporating, choose your verb, all the oxygen in the air in Washington right now, as well they should be, but for not the reasons that they are, in my view. Let me give you just a little bit of, of what I call my snapshot of history to kind of put this into some perspective for you, for me. I'm not going to try to rehearse everything, but I'm going to try to give you what I think is a historical background, a background that I used to use with my students at both universities and elsewhere in order to frame it for them so they could understand the evolution. Because a lot of my students were 19, 20 years old. They didn't even know who Colin Powell was. Some of them weren't even born when 9-11 occurred or were you know, little infants. So I said, quick brush, 1798, George Washington, beginning of the Republic, if you will. Four empires in the world. The British, the preeminent one in many respects, from whom we'd broken away, the Spanish, the French, and the Russian. Russian, yeah. They were messing around out in California and Idaho, what, what is California and Idaho today. So we had four empires in the world. So we had to mind our business, and we did. We were very circumspect about our business. We didn't send our military abroad to fight anybody because we'd get slaughtered if we did. So we were just intent on what historians have come to call manifest destiny, which is a terrible term. What we were doing, in essence, was ethnically cleansing the entire continent so we could have it all for ourselves principally against Native Americans and from time to time using some black Americans, Americans to help. Most Americans have no idea that blacks have served in the United States Army since its inception. There were 5,000 with General Washington, for example, and he only had about 27,000 effectives at any given time. And they served in every other conflict that we've ever been involved in including the ethnic cleansing out west with the Buffalo soldiers to aid it. So we went right on till we got to about 1860, and then we had a big, big war. The empires got interested in us when we did that. They sent battlefield observers to almost every major battle, Antietam, Gettysburg, Cole Harbor. At the end of that war, we had a million-plus men, it was all men then, under arms. The world, including the empires, were shivering because their consuls and their observers on those battlefields had sent word back. And the word was, be careful, watch out, because this military will be used. If you have this kind of battle-hardened, battle-ready military, it will be used. They were wrong. We disassembled that military in a matter of months. We sent it out, what was left, to finish the ethnic cleansing in the so-called Indian Wars from 18, 1866 to 1890. Then we just kind of tripped along, fat and happy. Grant made, made it into the presidency for two terms. We made treaty after treaty with those ethnic Americans, not a single one we ever kept. That is a factual statement. We have never kept one of our treaties, and there were many, with Native Americans. And then we got to Teddy Roosevelt, and Teddy started feeling his muscles a little bit. Remember, I said this is a real quick hash of our history, leaving a lot out. Great white fleet went around the world. The empires trembled again because it looked like there might be something aborning there. And by the way, by 1890, we had replaced the British in terms of the number one economic power in the world. What did we do? Well, we crept up on World War I. We had a racist named Woodrow Wilson in the presidency. 
and we crept into that war and we made a be Jesus fortune off of that war. We made so much money off the disputants on all sides that it was incredible. And then finally, we couldn't keep ourselves out of it. We wanted to make the world free for democracy. And so we got involved in that one. And we came home pretty soon after that. We weren't there really that long, if you think about it. And we really weren't in the battle that long. But we probably did make the decisive difference that made one of the world's worst conflagrations suddenly seem like just that terrible thing to be doing. France and Britain lost the flower of their manhood. Germany lost the flower of its manhood, but not to the extent that it couldn't come back because we made such a mess of the peace. And so we came back again. And again, we were reluctant until the Japanese hit us at Pearl Harbor. And that gave Roosevelt the opportunity to do what he had wanted to do for some time and was already doing. We'd been at war in the North Atlantic, for example, for a year before Pearl Harbor got hit. And we got into that one as the arsenal of democracy, and by Lord, we were. We supplied the Soviets 840,000 wheel vehicles we gave the Soviets. I used to show my students a picture of the Russian regimental commander coming into Berlin in 1945, and I had this capability to zoom in on the Jeep. I said, look, what kind of Jeep is that? It's a Ford Motor Company Jeep. We supplied the Free French, we supplied the British, we supplied ourselves. We were the arsenal of democracy. The Soviets beat the Wehrmacht, the finest military in the world at the operational level. They beat it all the way from Stalingrad all the way to Berlin. They beat the Germans. Normandy was an aftermath. Normandy was waltz into France and up to the Rhine. 78,000 casualties in the Battle of the Bulge because we took our eye off the ball, but still, the Soviets had really taken the fire out of the Wehrmacht. But at the end of that war, what were we? We were the new Rome. No question about it. 51% of the world's GDP. We made 50,000 airplanes in a single year. We couldn't make 200 in a single year now. The Army had 7,000 ships. The Navy had 13,000 ships. We left whole regiments of equipment in Tokyo Bay. Fish now make their nest around those reefs that we made in Tokyo Bay. We were the new Rome. Aha. But there was a Persia. You know anything about world history? There was a Persia. So we might have been the new Rome. We might have even been the Eastern Empire in Constantinople and the Western Empire in Rome itself together. But Persia was still fairly powerful. Persia, of course, was the Soviet Union. And the power equation was complicated majorly and existentially badly by the possession of nuclear weapons, which went to 60,000 warheads when the Cold War came to an end. Then we didn't have anyone. Then we went crazy, absolutely insane. And we have been insane ever since. Just tick them off. Your country has been in so many wars, killed so many people, destroyed so many societies, all in the name of freedom and democracy out of most presidents' lips, that it makes you sick if you sit down and count them up. And you listen to the hypocrites who talk about them in positive terms. Even Afghanistan, which I think I could make a case for, we didn't at the time. We said, we being Colin Powell and the State Department and others, you should keep on using law enforcement to fight terror. Law enforcement is what we use to fight terror. We shouldn't use the military instrument. But we understood when we were overruled because blood was in George W. Bush's mind. He called some Christians into his office and actually had them 
convince him not to be too much on a rampage. He even said this to us. He said, I had to get them in there, Billy Graham and all that bunch. I had to get them in there, and I had to sit around in the Oval Office with them, Franklin Graham. And I had to get them to calm me down because I was in a rage. I was in a rage. One thing Bush was, was a true born-again Christian. And don't ask me questions about that. So here we are. Maybe justified. Kofi and Anon at this UN even said okay. Didn't about Iraq later, but he did about Afghanistan. And what did we do? The one justifiable thing, perhaps, that we did, we just murdered. It stayed there 20 years until we didn't even know what we were doing there and then pulled out ignomin ignominiously. And the military paid the president for ordering it back the military screwed up the withdrawal in other words but in the interim we went to war and kofi didn't approve this one he said it was an illegal war and he was absolutely right read the u.n charter it was absolute he was absolutely right he did not the u.n security council did not give us their blessing to go to war in iraq but we went anyway killed tens of thousands of people drove millions into internal or external diaspora, ruined the Levant for 20 years. It still hasn't recovered. You ask any Iraqi today on the street of Baghdad if he was better off under Saddam Hussein or now, and he'll say Saddam Hussein for sure. And, oh, that wasn't all. We tried to knock out Bashar al-Assad. We recognize him as a legitimate leader of Syria, however despicable he might have been. We tried to knock him out. We failed. And Syria is a basket case now. And oh, oh, Hillary took us into Libya. And we messed that country up and got Muammar Gaddafi murdered. And she said the most impolitic diplomatic remark an American Secretary of State has ever made. And boy, that's a list. We came, we saw, and he died. I wanted to smack her. I wanted to smack her in the face. Just like I want to smack John Kirby every day when he gets up there and says things. Kirby getting up there and saying what he said about the South African application to the international court. A diplomat would have said, well, in response to the reporter's question, well, South Africa is a sovereign country. South Africa has every right to make an application to the court. South Africa is in the panoply of nations recognized by the United Nations. No, he gets up there and uses three despicable adjectives to describe the South Africans, not even thinking that in most people's eyes, especially Americans, South Africa is a black state. And he's a white man up there saying this. These people are crazy. They're insane. They have no diplomatic skill whatsoever. They have no common humanity whatsoever. They're despicable, unconscionable people. Now, that's the short history. Where are we today? We are mired in two conflicts that are absolutely, unbelievably insane. One is Ukraine, and the other is Gaza. They are very different conflicts. One is in the heart of Europe. One is in the heart of the Levant, if you will, with our erstwhile ally, Israel. But they have some characteristics that are similar. The first one is they are both insane. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever what we're doing in either place. And let me start with Ukraine for just a minute or two. Back to that sketch I gave you, but not very far. Back to the end of the Cold War. I was there with my boss. He was there with Ronald Reagan when he was National Security Advisor to Ronald Reagan, his last one, and then the deputy before that. So two years with Reagan. And those two years were also with H.W. Bush, who was then the vice president for eight years for Ronald Reagan. He was there in St. Catherine's Palace with Gorbachev. He was there on Long Island with H.W. Bush, Reagan, and Gorbachev. He was there with Shevardnadze when they did this. Shevardnadze was the foreign minister of the Soviet Union slash Russia at that time. Really Mikhail Gorbachev's right-hand man. We were all there when 
we said, in essence, hey, this is a really special moment. And Gorbachev was a special creature in that moment. We are going to take advantage of this. And Bush said, we are not going to beat our chest. That was his exact words. We are not going to beat our chest. We're not going to trumpet our victory. We're not going to step on them with track shoes. We're going to establish some sort of regime, he called it the new world order, in the world that will live up to the very standards we put in the U.N. Charter. That's what we're going to try to do. And Helmut Kohl, Chancellor of Germany, a brilliant man, Francois Mitterrand in France, Maggie Thatcher and John Major in England and others, were on the phone every day trying to discuss what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. When Helmut Kohl was told that maybe he could reunify Germany, he was stunned. He didn't know whether he wanted to. Smart man. First of all, it was going to cost, by their own estimates, 80 billion U.S. It wound up costing about 200 billion U.S. <laughs> but that was the projection at that time, and that was really formidable from Bond's perspective, West Germany's perspective. Then when he was told that Gorbachev would probably let him stay in NATO if he reunified, he was thunderstruck. He couldn't believe it. And initially, he was against it. Why? because he knew that Moscow's vibes would be a little negative, no matter what Gorbachev said. He has to live with that 11-time zone country. And so he was a little bit concerned. He wanted to do it. He wanted to be the chancellor who reunified Germany, and he wanted to stay in NATO, but really uneasy about it. H.W. Bush took care of that unease. And so did Mikhail Gorbachev. And Francois Mitterrand came right along, too. One of the reasons was because both Jim Baker, H.W.'s Secretary of State, and H.W. himself told Gorbachev, if all of this comes to pass, NATO will not move one inch further east. Now, today, Bill Clinton and a host of other neophyte asses have essentially said that was just a spoken word, and that's not sealing. You know, gentlemen's words are not treaties. That's right out of Bill Clinton's mouth, as a matter of fact. Well, I'm sorry. That's not the world I grew up in. The world I grew up in is your word is your bond, whether you're a diplomat, a president, or whatever. Well, so we just violated that, and we've been violating it ever since. Anatoly Chubai and Larry Summers, you've heard that name before, I'm sure, raped, pillaged, and plundered Moscow with fire sales of all the old Soviet Union hard assets to the oligarchs. And the fees they gained off of that increased, for example, Harvard's endowment by about $19.6 billion overnight. Was Larry Summers really fired because he made some impolitic remarks about women in science? Or was he fired because Harvard figured out where the money came from? Didn't give it back, of course. Russia, in other words, has no reason to believe or respect or to have anything to do with Washington. And Putin tried, and I have no love for Vladimir Putin, but he tried time and time again to prevent having to use troops in Ukraine. He even gave us a dramatic example. My president, George W. Bush, Neil Fight par excellence, went to Tbilisi. And standing beside that young president, Saakashvili, who is now mayor of Odessa, show you how Georgians get around, stood right there beside him in the public square and said Georgia would be a member of NATO in the future. What did Putin do? He invaded, took the two northwestern uh, oblasts, uh, for all practical purposes, still some Russian troops there. What would we think he'd do with Ukraine? Much, much, much more strategic. 
Of course he's going to invade. But this time he decided, I think, he was going to teach us a little bit of a lesson. And he really didn't invade to take Keefe. He didn't invade to do anything but to teach those Johnny come lately and keep who were being back to the hilt by us and had been since 2002. I was there, remember? Didn't leave the State Department until 2005. I was there with Temeshenko and Yatoshenko and all those criminals because that's what they were. Yulia Temeshenko was even that. We had been fomenting the situation in Ukraine since at least 2002 and big time since 2006 and 7 when the European commander, four-star Air Force General Philip Breedlove, used to get on his Harley, yes, and ride down the Autobahns and on down into Ukraine and talk with the Azov Battalion and others like that. We have been in Ukraine fomenting all manner of unrest to get at Russia. Weak, very weak. We can take them on. We can take them on. So all the neoconservatives came out of the woodwork. Okay, let's finish Russia off before we do China. And Ukraine was the way we were going to do it. Wrong, people. Wrong. You misjudge, misestimated <laughs> George W. Bush. <laughs> Russia. Yeah, Russia lost in 1917. Had a lot of other things going on, though, in World War I. Oh, yeah, well, Russia's been beaten before, you know, blah, blah, blah. I've heard all the arguments. Eleven time zones. You don't go to war with a country of 150 million people of 11 time zones, the strategic depth like no other country in the world, with roughly 38 million in Ukraine. You just don't do it. Even if you've got NATO behind you, you don't have anything but their arms behind you and their money. That's not going to beat the Russians. So now we're in a mess, complete mess. They have lost. They have lost so badly. If you're familiar with von Clausewitz and his von Krieg on war, you understand that war has its own dynamic. And every day that dynamic changes. Well, right now, the Russian military and Putin are looking at the dynamic favoring them, which says, why stop now? They didn't want all of Ukraine. What would he want with all of Ukraine? He'd have a guerrilla war on his hands. For If you've not looked at Napoleon and how the Ukrainian partisans fell on him, or you haven't looked at the Nazis, or for that matter, the Russians themselves, whom the Ukrainian partisans fell on, they didn't give a hoot who you were, communist, Marxist, capitalist, or whatever, they're bloody-minded people. They would fall on you and kill you and take your gold teeth. And that's what we're talking about. That's really what we're talking about. It hasn't changed a whole lot. He didn't want that. All he wanted was a little bit of control over those portions of Ukraine where dominant Russian populations existed and were being treated very terribly. And he was right. They were. As Ukraine's leadership changed, the pendulum swung one, one way and the other. But a lot of that pendulum was being pushed by us and by the British. Oh, don't let me forget perfidious Albion. I don't even recognize London anymore. I don't even recognize the British people anymore. Um, they're right in there, in for a penny, in for a pound. I'm going to put some troops and so, oh, do you know your military is about as big as a battalion of the American military? The British military is so small, you could put it in Ukraine, it'd be subsumed in 15 minutes. So where are we there? We're, we're at a point where they have lost and we're killing people still, even though they've lost. And we have a leader in Zelensky who's courageous, valorous, brave, use all the adjectives you want to, but hasn't a clue how to get out of this. <clears throat> so he's got to go. Got to have somebody in there who's interested in the future of Ukraine. And he's got to have somebody in Washington that backs that. Won't happen until the election's over. Because Joe Biden has been told by his advisors, and I think Joe himself thinks, and I've known him for a long time, that he can't get reelected if he's seen as cutting and running. 
So he's going to do an LBJ. LBJ knew that George Ball was right. He knew that he couldn't win in Vietnam. Quote from LBJ, a quote, a direct quote, oh, ho, ain't going to be moved by no bombs. This is when he's being told by the Air Force that he should kill two and a half million Vietnamese with more iron bombs than we dropped in World War II on Germany. Why? And 30,000 more names on that big black marble wall down in Washington. Why? Because I don't want to be seen as cutting and running. Prestige, what Dean Acheson called the shadow of power. Prestige. A lot of things wrapped up in that word with Joe Biden and Ukraine, too. Don't want to be proved so blatantly wrong. That's where we are in Ukraine. Gaza, another matter altogether. We are paying for our fidelity to a people. 85% of the Israeli people who are Jewish are for this war. They don't necessarily like Netanyahu, but they are for what he's doing. We are lashed up to them in a way that is so debilitating, so against our national security interests, so against our humanitarian and reputational interests that it makes your heart hurt to be in Washington and see it happening every day. And when Schumer gets up and makes a political statement, and that's what it was, pure politics, he sees all those people going away from the ballot box, and so he's got to make some overture in order to try and get them back. Does he really mean what he's saying? No, he's probably just like Mitch McConnell if you scratched him hard. It's unconscionable what I'm seeing happening in Washington. And every time somebody excoriates me or comes after me in some way for my appearances on television or whatever, I get a even more visceral view of these poisonous people who think first, too many of them think Israel's doing the right thing. One said to me, a patent neoconservative, if they weren't killing them, we'd have to be there killing them. And I asked him, explain yourself. What the hell do you mean? They're all terrorists. Those women and children at the foot of that hospital, that 2,000-pound bomb dropped on that you made and sent to them, they're terrorists? Well, they're supporting terrorists. They will. They'll grow up and be terrorists. It reminded me of what one person told me, a Serb who was a sniper in Sarajevo, and he just shot a 13-year-old boy on the street, and he was asked by a UN, before, uh, UN uh, peacekeeping force officer why he did that. And he said, because he'll grow up to be a terrorist. Well, that's what these people think. That's what these people think, and that's what Netanyahu thinks. And let me tell you another thing about Netanyahu and what he's been doing since he was finance minister. Netanyahu, first of all, running for office, created the turmoil and the anger that got Yitzhak Rabin assassinated. And then the settler who assassinated him, he resurrected him and made him a hero. This is Bibi Netanyahu. This isn't something new, what he's doing. He's been doing this for over 15 years, personally orchestrating it. Now, he's in and out of the political realm in different niches because he has to keep getting elected. Otherwise, he'd go to jail. But he's been doing this, what has now come to fruition in Gaza, for longer than 15 years. Slowly but surely, he's been exterminating the Palestinians in the West Bank. If you've been there, you know that it now has roads running through it. Some of them look like Audubons. And they're all to connect Israeli settlements and to screen out Palestinians. Ben Gavir has brought a new vengeance to this. Ben Gavir, his director of security, is handing out weapons now. AR-15 type weapons now for the settlers because what is their intent now that they've almost finished the West Bank and they've started on and will finish East Jerusalem fairly swiftly, their intent is to go into Gaza and to do it in Gaza. You may have seen the protests that occurred around the food, I wouldn't call them protests, the turmoil 
that occurred around the uh, food trucks not too long ago, about a week ago or so, and they killed a couple of hundred people. Well, part of that was because they got the settlers in there, too. The settlers are getting ready to do the things they did in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem, but now in Gaza. Rafa and what he's going to do there is probably the final act in terms of extermination, just outright extermination, and evacuation. He's going to have some left. So my query the other day of one of the guys who's been talking about this with me is he's on the ground in, in Gaza. What do you think is going to happen to the, the ones that are left alive? Well, they're going to go somewhere, and it isn't going to be staying in Gaza. Well, Egypt has said they won't take them. Jordan has said they won't take them. You can't push anymore into other places. You can't push them into the Sinai. What, what is going to happen? Well, he'll cross that bridge when he comes to it. I said, man, I've heard that before. Where would you hear that before? When Will Taft, Powell's lawyer, asked Rumsfeld, Will said essentially, you got a 13-year-old down there in Guantanamo, a 13-year-old. Let's say he lives to be 80. Are you prepared to see him stay there for almost another 70 years? And Rumsfeld looked at him and said, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Well, Rumsfeld's dead. We've crossed that bridge, and we still have people in Guantanamo. Bibi wants to get through this, stay out of jail, and turn it over to the next guy, who will do the same damn thing because they've been doing it since 1967. Palestinians would probably say they've been doing it since the Nakba. But they've definitely been doing it in contravention of international law, in contravention of what we say we stand for since 1967. And here's another thing. I became an Amaki Kurai on a court case that hinges around the courts, and we're contesting this decision by the courts, the courts at the federal district level having decided that Gaza is a foreign policy issue, and so the courts have no jurisdiction. And one of the things they're claiming is that Israel's actions on October the 7th were self-defense under Article 51 of the UN Charter. Here's my argument back to them. Israel has been under the UN Charter as an occupying power and under Geneva since 1967. It has never, never fulfilled its responsibilities as an occupying power, never intended to fulfill them. In fact, it has dispossessed the Palestinians of their lands, of their orchards, destroyed their homes, kill their children. It is an irresponsible under the law occupying power. Therefore, the Palestinians had every right to do what they did on October the 7th. That is not very comfortable in Washington to make that kind of statement, especially not amongst Jewish Americans or people who are tightly tied to Israel. But it is the facts and I can't wait to see what the judge says when he reads this case, if we get it to go forward. But that's how entrenched we are in it, because we are, as Gideon Levy from Haaretz has said so many times, every time that F-16 flies over Gaza and drops that 250-pound bomb and kills that child, you are guilty, America. You are as guilty as Bibi as anybody in that right-wing Likud administration, you are just as guilty because you are enabling it. They could not do it without you. They are drawing on our largest war reserve stockpile in the world, which is in Israel. Not only that, and they're getting extra munitions from all over the place. In fact, we're running so low now on certain key munitions that you've got the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and other service chiefs weighing in with the White House. you got to stop this. Between Ukraine and Israel, we are becoming toolless, ammunitionless, etc. So the military is even weighing into it now. 
That's beside the point. These wars, Ukraine and Gaza, are at the top of the list of 20 years of stupid, insane wars. Thanks.